In the last Wrestling Bios video looking at the career of Hulk Hogan, we left off just as Hogan had returned to the WWF in 1983. Hogan's time in the AWA was extremely important when discussing the man's rise in pro wrestling. It really can't be argued that it was in the AWA where Hogan really became a huge fan favourite, but his upcoming WWF stint here in 1983 would turn Hulk Hogan from a superstar into a worldwide megastar. Vince McMahon had purchased the WWF from his father the year prior, having grand ideas to expand the New York Territory into a nationwide juggernaut, and Vince McMahon had selected Hulk Hogan to lead the charge in this monumental task. Hogan would be the face of the company, the big babyface star, the American hero, with Vince feeling like Hulk Hogan could very well be the man that helps make the WWF a powerhouse in American wrestling. Of course, we all know that Vince McMahon was purchasing top talent from every territory across America in order to not only become the number one wrestling organisation in the country, but to also hurt those same territories that, ironically enough, his father had great relationships with. But out of all of this top talent that Vince McMahon had taken from every major promotion in America, it speaks volumes still that Hulk Hogan was selected as the company golden boy. Like it or not, Hogan would be the man in the World Wrestling Federation and the success he had in his new role here cannot be questioned. Hulk Hogan's first match back in the WWF was on the 27th of December 1983 against Bill Dixon at the Chase Park Plaza Hotel in Missouri. This match has survived, it's available online and you can watch it right now with a quick google search. Don't worry about the confused dates, the match aired on the 1st of January the following year. Hogan was introduced as the Incredible Hulk Hogan, playing off the Incredible Hulk Marvel Comics here. Just to get it out of the way also, Marvel Comics would end up obtaining the trademarks for the names Hulk Hogan, the Hulkster and Hulkamania, and Titan Sports had to agree to remove the Incredible name tag away from Hogan. Marvel would also receive a 0.9% cut of Hogan's merchandise sales along with a cash payment every time Hulk Hogan worked the match. This was around $100. This agreement was in place for 20 years, so you can imagine how much money Marvel made from the Hulk Hogan name during this time period. Anyway, Hogan comes to the ring here with Eye of the Tiger playing in Chase Park Plaza and the fans love him here. His association with Freddy Blassie during his previous stint had all been forgiven. Hogan hits the leg drop, the crowd goes nuts and Hogan wins his return match. Exactly one day before Hulk Hogan had his return match, Bob Backlund dropped the WWF Championship to the Iron Sheik. Hindsight being 2020, we can see here that Sheik was holding on to the title in order to drop it to the Hulkster in a future match. Bob Backlund, in Vince McMahon's eyes, was yesterday's news at this point. It was all about getting the strap on Hogan, and it happened in record time. Hogan had two more matches in the WWF here before meeting Sheik in Madison Square Garden on the 23rd of January 1984. The first match was a tag team showdown featuring Hulk Hogan teaming up with former champion Bob Backlund to take on Mr. Fuji and Tiger Chung Lee. The babyfaces got the win here, and the second match was against Gilbert Guerrero. Hogan won this match in around a minute. The next match then would be Hulk Hogan vs The Iron Sheik in Madison Square Garden. The day Hulkamania was born and the business of professional wrestling would be changed forever. There's a legendary story here in regards to Iron Sheik being offered money to break Hulk Hogan's leg in the middle of the ring on this very night. The thing is, it appears to be a true story. Many people, including Hulk Hogan, the Iron Sheik, producers and workers, have told the story over and over again and there has never been a debunking of the tale, so I'm going to say that this did really happen. Vern Gagne apparently offered Iron Sheik $100,000 to legitimately hurt Hogan in the ring. Remember, Vern and Hogan had a bad relationship towards the end of Hulk's AWA run, so the motive here was to stop Hogan from becoming this huge WWF megastar by having his leg broke. It's been reported that Sheik approached Vince McMahon before the match and told Vince about the offer, however Sheik also told Vince that he had no problems putting Hogan over because of how good the WWF had been to the Sheik until that point. 
Vince, when approached by Sheik, wasn't sure if he was being held up for more money, but Sheik was simply letting Vince know about the offer and confirming to Vince that he was not going to hurt Hulk Hogan in the ring. I know Sheik is absolute comedy gold these days, and his eccentrics are of the highest quality imaginable, but back then he was all about the business. Iron Sheik said, Well, I didn't mind because I have a lot of respect for Mr. McMahon and his family, and whatever he told me, I did it for them because Mr. McMahon is the number one promoter in the world. In regards to being offered money to hurt Hulk Hogan, Sheik said, that's legit because over there at that time, Hulk Hogan was in Minnesota and from Minnesota he came through to New York and Mr. Vern Gagne, one night before, he called me and told me, don't drop the belt to Hogan, come back to Minnesota, I will take care of you and give you $100,000. Hogan didn't know about this cash offer to break his leg when he went into the ring to win the WWF Championship for the very first time, but the match itself went off without a hitch, and you better believe that if Bob Backlund was on the opposing side of the ring, then the ovation may not have been so one-sided. Bob Backlund still had fans in New York during this time, so give Aaron Sheik credit here, he was the perfect villain to go against the American maid Hulk Hogan. The storyline going in here and Hogan's abrupt push to the main event was explained as Hogan being a last minute replacement for Bob Backlund in this match. Hulk got the win with the big leg drop and the reaction from the audience was second to none, it's a moment in wrestling history here for sure. Gorilla Monsoon famously says on the headset that Hulkamania is here and the dominating run of Hulk Hogan at the top of the wrestling mountain had only just begun. Andre the Giant celebrated with Hulk Hogan backstage after the match, a man who would play an important role soon when talking about the history of Hulk Hogan in the World Wrestling Federation. Immediately after winning the WWF Championship, Hulk Hogan went back to Japan for just over a week to take part in an NJPW tour. Interesting about this time period here is that Hulk Hogan teamed up with Bret Hart on the 6th of February 1982 in a losing effort, but still interesting stuff. When Hogan returned to America, the Rockets were strapped to his back with a series of successful title defenses against the likes of David Schultz, Greg Valentine, Paul Orndorff and the Iron Sheik. Hogan would continue to split his time between New Japan and the WWF for much of the first half of 1984, finishing the year off with title defences against Roddy Piper and Big John Studd, just to name a few. Every match followed the same routine. Hogan would get some offence in, but his opponent would begin destroying him. When his opponent hit a finisher, Hogan would spring back to his feet, hulk up and put his opponent away with the big leg drop. This routine, as mundane as one may find it today, worked absolute wonders. Fans could not get enough of Hogan's heroic comebacks. On the mic, Hogan began referring to his fans as Hulkamaniacs, encouraging fans to train hard, eat their vitamins and say their prayers. It all fell into place wonderfully for Terry Bollea and the World Wrestling Federation. This was their winning formula. The planets also aligned for Hulk Hogan in 1984 thanks to wrestling becoming part of mainstream pop culture, owing a lot of this to the rock and wrestling connection. In 1983, Captain Lou Albano had met with singer Cindy Lauper on a trip to Puerto Rico, and this trip resulted in Lauper asking the captain to appear in her music video for the single Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Vince McMahon would go on to boot Captain Lou and Cindy Lauper into a Piper's Pit segment on WWF TV, and this coupling of music and wrestling really began to blossom. MTV then would have wrestling shows on their channel, even broadcasting the very first live wrestling match on cable television. The brawl to end it all and later the war to settle the score were both successful WWF shows that aired on MTV and this partnership only helped the WWF and Hulk Hogan become more prominent to audiences of entertainment in general, not just your typical pro wrestling fans. Mainstream attention was what Vince McMahon sorely craved during this time period. It's what would ultimately set him apart from his competition, much to the dismay of wrestling traditionalists at the time. 
The AWA had Super Sunday and soon they would have their Super Clash shows, the NWA had Starcade, and World Class Championship Wrestling had their Star Wars shows. All of these were considered the biggest yearly events of their respective company's calendars. Vince McMahon then would present WrestleMania to the world held in Madison Square Garden on the 31st of March 1985 and broadcasted to over 130 closed circuit networks. MTV's popularity and coverage of wrestling with the Wendy Richter and Cindy Lauper partnership had generated a huge amount of interest in the World Wrestling Federation's programming at this time, so the concept of WrestleMania was to mix the world of wrestling with the world of celebrity and entertainment on this extravagant super show. Dubbed the Super Bowl of professional wrestling, Vince McMahon gambled a great deal by presenting WrestleMania and he needed it to work. Hulk Hogan headlined the show, tagging up with his friend Mr. T to take on Paul Orndorff and Roddy Piper, and before the show, a ton of media work was done by Hulk Hogan and Mr. T, which put the guys on TV a lot more. Famously, on March 20th, 1985, just 11 days before WrestleMania, Hogan and Mr. T appeared on the Hot Properties talk show, where Hogan applied a guillotine choke to host Richard Besler, who in fairness had been making light of wrestling and the dramatic surrounding a wrestling match. The chokehold completely knocked out Richard Besler, fell to the ground, cracked his head and had to go to hospital. But anyway, Hogan and Mr. T won at the inaugural WrestleMania. The event was a massive success, which done nothing but further elevate the WWF as a force in the world of entertainment, along with further elevating Hulk Hogan as the number one wrestling attraction in the world. It was nothing but win after win for Hulk Hogan immediately following WrestleMania 1, taking on the likes of Bob Orton, Jesse Ventura and Paul Orndorff as the world just couldn't get enough of Hulk Hogan. May 11th 1985 saw the TV debut of Saturday Night's Main Event airing on NBC and drawing a staggering 8.8 rating. This show featured Hulk Hogan with Mr. T in his corner, taking on Cowboy Bob Orton with Roddy Piper in his corner. Hogan picked up a DQ win here and the WWF picked up a huge television rating. Saturday Night's Main Event 2 held on October 3rd but airing on October 5th saw Hulk Hogan defeat Nikolai Volkov in a flag match, again scoring another massive NBC TV rating with an 8.3. The biggest Saturday Night's Main Event rating though happened on the January 4th 1986 episode. A 10.4 rating was earned on a show that featured Hulk Hogan defeating Terry Funk. The later half of 1985 also saw Hulk Hogan get his very own Saturday morning cartoon, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, and this is just another example of how Hulk Hogan and the WWF had crossed over into the mainstream. The beginning of 1986 followed the same formula as 1985, Hogan destroying heels on a regular basis. It didn't let up at all, there was no stopping Hulkamania, night after night, sell out after sell out, Hulk Hogan became a megastar. Vince McMahon's plans to use Hulk as the face of the company had worked wonders, and while many fans still preferred the NWA style of grittier and, dare I say, more realistic wrestling, the mainstream audience, the casual fans, children, grandparents, they all loved Hulk Hogan, and they all loved watching the WWF. Vince McMahon decided his dominant wrestling company could host WrestleMania 2 in three different cities across America in one night, attempting to top the NWA Starcade 85 being held in two cities in the process, and Hulk Hogan headlined the whole thing by taking on King Kong Bundy inside a steel cage at the Los Angeles portion of the show. Hogan of course won the match, and it again followed the same Hogan match formula that fans were accustomed to over the past year or so, but still, the audience in LA went nuts for the outcome. WrestleMania 2, as a wrestling show in itself, wasn't all that great in my opinion, but you can learn more about that in my WrestleMania 2 video. Hulk Hogan's next WrestleMania match would become one of the more legendary matches when we look at the entire career of the Hulkster. Hogan vs Andre the Giant not only drew a record setting audience to WrestleMania 3 in the Pontiac Silverdome, but the build of the match was expertly done, the first real time here that the WWF took time to tell a proper story going into a WrestleMania main event. Sure, there were storylines going into WrestleMania 1 and 2, but the Hogan vs Andre story was done on an entirely different level. 
What's also notable about this match though is just how much it has fans split in two. Some critics see it as a pivotal moment in wrestling history, while others, like Mr Dave Meltzer, wouldn't be as complimentary. So we will end this look at the rise of Hulkamania right here, and next time we will dig into the Andre vs Hogan match at WrestleMania 3, a match that I feel deserves a video all to itself. Hopefully you enjoyed this look back at Hogan's early success within the World Wrestling Federation. As mentioned before, I'm putting together an entire series of Hulk Hogan career videos with the aim of covering his entire story within wrestling over the course of multiple uploads. You can check out a video right now on Hogan's pre-WWF days and I've also got two videos uploaded that look at Hogan's first years within WCW. The next video uploaded in the Hogan series will be the Andre vs Hulk video, so look out for that in the future.